friends, my name is Irvin, also known as Kaboomen. This is a quick desktop support tutorial on how to share an extra drive over the network. So why would you want to do this? If you want to have a centralized point on your home network and you want to share a drive that has, for example, some media files on it or some important files that you want to have quick access to or simply take up a lot of space, and you want to be able to simply access it from another computer on the network, this is how you would do it. One way to do that is to share it. So let's go through this and how to do it. Let's say that this drive here is the drive I want to share. It's called new volume and it's under letter E. We're going to right click it and we're going to select properties and then we're going to look for a tab that says sharing. We're going to select sharing and then underneath what we're looking for is a button called advanced sharing. We're going to select that and then we're going to simply do a check mark right here where it says share this folder. And uh, one last thing that we have to do here in order to be able to you know read and write on our share drive over the network we have to change the permissions here which is super simple. We're going to select permissions here and we can see that by default everyone is allowed to do so which normally is fine and this is why by default but you cannot change or write or anything like that and especially you don't have full control so if you want to simply select full control and allow everyone that's on the network have access to this you can certainly do so and that would solve your problem however I like to add my own login because I don't want everybody to access it so in order to do that, I'm going to remove these. I'm going to leave it read only so that everyone can see it, but they can't make changes. And I'm going to add my own login. So if, if I click add, I can add my own login name, which is used for this computer where this drive is located. This is incredibly important. You want to use the login for this computer. So login name for my computer is Kaboomman0. And I'm going to, you can simply double check by click check names if you want, but I, I know it exists obviously, so I'm just going to click OK. Now we can see that it's there and it's under the name of the computer, which is called Kobuman, and the login name is Kobuman0. So this is important to remember here that the name of this computer where this drive is located is called Kobuman. So before we leave this pop up or before we leave this, uh, box we have to make sure that our login is selected and then we select full control because if you go down to here we can still see that everyone only has read option and then if we do select Kobume we can still see that it is full control this will allow us to create new files folders drop drag and drop anything we want and full access to it incredibly important all right now let's click apply and OK after you click apply and OK, you can see that now this drive is being shared and it's indicated by two little guys here as an icon. Now let's go to the other computer and see what we can do to access this. Here we go. Here's our other computer that we're at. And now we just need to access it. So how do we do that? We remember the name of the computer, which is Kobuman, correct? We're going to type in backslash backslash Kobuman and then another backslash and we're going to type in the letter E, which was the drive letter for our drive that is being shared over there. We're going to hit enter. And there we go. We have access to it. But wait, this is under everyone. Remember, we didn't put in our credentials at all. It may ask you at some point if you're doing this for the first time to actually put in your credentials. But if you didn't get a pop up, you'll be using it on the default, which is everyone. So how that? I mean, it's great. If you got the pop-up, you can just simply put in your login information, but this is just us able to access it. Let's go ahead and create what would look like just like a regular hard drive, and that is called mapping the network drive. So we're going to select our computer, and we're going to select map network drive. Now let me go back. Make sure you're at this tab where it says this PC, and then select computer up here and then select map network drive. And here we can leave the drive letter to whatever we want. And then we're going to type in again, backslash, backslash, name of the computer, which is Kobuman, and then backslash and then drive letter. One thing to make sure to do is place a check mark right here, which says connect using different credentials. 
this will let us specify the login we want to use with full control and with the pop-up here uh, we can see that um, I already tried this earlier but let's go ahead and this is how it looked like I'm gonna click you know use different account and then I'm going to type in the name for the login on the remote computer which is Kobuman zero and then I'm going to type in my password and select remember my credentials you know kind of remember to select that click OK and now we're inside of our drive you can see now it comes up as a network location another way to do this is add a network location but I just map it as a network drive. So now that we go inside of it, we have direct access to it. We can create new folder. We can go inside, create new files, drag and drop, whatever we want. And it's all great and dandy. This is also a good way to use a remote drive as a backup location if you are doing desktop support. For example, let's say you're you know, reimaging a computer and you need a remote location to use as a backup for users profiles this is a good way of doing it so you have a backup also if you're replacing your hard drive or something like that that you need a good remote place to quickly back up all your files i hope you guys like this video if you did please share it or like it if you have any questions i am here to help you answer them so feel free to ask me anything Thank you and have a good day. Hello my friends, my name is Irvin, also known as Kobuman. In today's video, we're going to talk about three different videos, three different topics for desktop support, and if you're also learning help desk. Very useful stuff. The first one is about ping command, how to use ping command and how to resolve issues using it. Second one is about trace route. Ever heard about trace RT command? Well, I'm going to talk about it and we're going to learn about it. Very cool and interesting stuff. Last thing we're going to talk about is reliability monitor. A lot of people don't know about it, but reliability monitor is kind of like software, but it's actually built into Windows. I know it's actually software, but it's part of Windows. And uh, we're going to learn about it because it's kind of cool and not many people know about it. And it can help you resolve weird computer issues that are kind of apparent and easy to actually visualize using Reliability Monitor. It really tells you what's going on. All right, guys, let's check it out. But before we do that, please take one second to like this video. It really makes a big difference to me and my channel. It really helps me grow and whatnot. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you doing that. So if you're doing tech support or desktop, desktop support or what have you, chances are you'll be using ping command. So what is ping command and its use? I'm going to talk about the first part of it and explain the whole thing. But my written answer here is generally the ping command is used to determine whether your computer has access to external resources or the internet. So anything that is considered external resources is anything that's outside of the connection of your computer. So let's say you're using a desktop PC at work or a laptop, and then you're trying to access an external resource like a shared drive or a server or a website, whether it's internal or external, and you are you can't connect to it or there's a you know, issue with latency or lag of some sort, it's running slow, that's how ping command would be used. And all these things are considered as external resources. So something that your computer connects to over the network. Okay. Now through command prompt, CMD, you can type in, for example, ping www.microsoft.com. And this is an example of a ping command. So let's go ahead and open up CMD. I'm going to open up command line, command prompt, or whatever you call it. I keep saying command prompt, command line. I use Linux too, so sometimes I forget which one is which. Anyways, we're going to use this example that we have here, and it's ping www.microsoft.com. So let's see what happens when a normal working website is up and running and see the result from it. Did I misspell that? Of course I did microsoft.com I'm trying to multitask here so <laughs> you will forgive me <laughs> okay so 
One of the first things that comes up that you will notice here is a number, which is an IP address, which is uh, controlled by the DNS. And the DNS, basically what it does is takes a domain name, in this case, Microsoft.com, and translates it into a, an IP address, which is the location of this website on a server. So the server for Microsoft.com is located at 23.45.133.21. So that's the IP address for the server, uh, of the server for, the, for Microsoft.com. Okay, so now these are real results of the ping command for a normal running website that is up and running and there are no problems. So what happens is ping command sends four packets of data. So you can see here that it sent four packets. They are size of 32 bytes. And then it waits for a response and how long it takes to respond, which is shown here in milliseconds. So this is the first attempt from uh, off the ping to this IP address and we can see that the response time here that it took 14 milliseconds to respond and then the ping command does it again which is the second time and this time it replied in 15 milliseconds and then the third time also 15 milliseconds and then fourth time also 15 milliseconds hence four packets sent right very very easy to understand but of course, for it to actually respond, for actually to have a response of any sort, it has to send back four packets as well. So you can see here that the server at 23.45.133.21 also sent back four packets which were received at the same size. And then we can see that lost zero, that means it was successful. That means none of the packets failed that all the four pings were successful. That's a, an example of successful ping command. We know everything is okay with this website. So let's go find a website that doesn't work. So I went to this website and this website kind of tells you of some of the, you know, big websites that are down. So let's kind of pick a random one here. Let's pick Trivago.com here. That's a safe website. We go on to type in ping Trivago. Let's do www.trivago.com. Www now, if this website is down, like it says it is, we're going to get some negative results, which would be a good example of use of, of how you use a ping command and how to help you troubleshoot the issues. So, so far, we can see that it's timing out. What does that mean? That the first packet was sent and it didn't connect. It waited a certain amount of time, didn't connect to the server, or the server didn't reply, I should say, and then it timed out. And then the second time as well, I'm sorry, first time, second time, and we're waiting for the third one. Third one timed out. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to go all full screen here. Let me kind of move some of this stuff out of the way so it's easier to see. And we can see that all four packets sent timed out. That means that the server just we you know the the ping you know waited waited you know we waited and the server didn't respond time out there's only a certain amount of time ping command will wait for a response and that's what happened and we can again see here that four packets are sent so and then zero received and in this example trivago.com is located at this ip address that's the server that's the web server for the trivago.com and now we can see that we sent four we waited, we waited, nothing happened, we received zero because it's down, and then we lost four. That means we sent four, and they never came back, which gives us 100% loss of packets. So how does this help us? Well, for, for one thing, we know the website is down, or you know, a server that you're trying to access at your job is down. Right, we can, you know, web server or some some other network component, some other network resources. You know, if you have the name for it or the IP address, you can just ping the IP address. If you wanted to, you can just type in ping, you know, IP address three five one seven nine dot zero zero two dot two zero zero. And here we go again. We're pinging Trivago's server, except we're just directly 
bypassing the domain name and we're bypassing the DN well we're not necessarily bypassing the but we're bypassing the uh, domain name we're going directly to pinging the server itself and again it's timing out which is another indicator that the website is down so going back to the uh, my question of how does this help us aside from knowing that the website is down so if it's an external website what we would have to do is find the web uh, webmaster for it or a person who has access to the server same thing goes for if it's ex internal website so let's say your business the, or the business that you work for has some kind of internal website that everybody goes to everybody uses it you know this and that and you know you don't have necessarily access to it you would find that webmaster and contact them so how would you go about that well if you know who the owner of Travago.com is, you would contact them directly, obviously. But if you don't know who the owner is, based off the, the name of the Travago.com, based off the domain name, you can see who the owner is of this IP address. And this is something that uh, this is something that your company would provide this to you if you're doing tech support. So you would basically have a tool that lets you tool or you know some kind of notes or something i don't know if this is all depends on this varies from place to place you know but for example at my main job i know i will know who owns this ip address so not only can i look up to see who owns trivago.com for example i can also look up who owns this ip address and then i would contact that guy who is the owner of this ip address or a guy or a gal or whatever um, I, I would contact them and say, hey, this website is down. But the only time I would do that is if I don't have direct access to this. So let's say it, this is a server that I have, you know, that I'm running and everybody in the business here is using it as just a storage location. You know, let's say this is just a web server that hosts files for everybody in my building that I support. Well, I would simply just try this. You know, if I don't have physical access to it, I would open up remote desktop connection, type in 8.35.179.200. See if I can connect to it. You know, and it's going to fail because obviously I don't have access to it. And, you know, that's okay. But if I have physical access to it and... I know where it's located in the data center or in a server room or whatever it is. Chances are this, you know, this server might be just turned off or, you know, there might be something else bad with it. But at least I will know that there is something wrong going on by using the ping command. And that will get me to either me fixing it or finding who can fix it. And that's how you would use ping command in a business and environment either way uh, for this we're going to need a command line which we're going to open up right now so in order to use traceroute we're basically going to use the example from the article it's simply typed in trace rt <coughs> pardon me trace rt followed by the name of the website you're trying to reach this doesn't have to be a website. It could be a server of some sort or a switch, or I should say just an IP address of um, a network uh, component or a location. So, and that gets me into why would you want to use trace RT before I even hit enter here and then a bunch of stuff comes up. I want you to understand why you would want to use it. So let's say at your work, at your office for some reason you cannot reach cosmicnova.com however from your phone which is by the way on a network on a different network entirely you can reach cosmic novo just fine also another example is an application that uses um, network connection to work for example an application that has to reach to a database that could be located in totally different state country this and that it could be at the end of the world it could be that it's not working that's another reason you would want to use traceroute or 
simply there is a server somewhere we can't reach, whether it's used for storage or this and that, we would want to use Traceroute to figure out why you can't reach it from your office network, but you can reach it from any other network. So what it does, in the nutshell, Traceroute, it traces all the routes taken on the network to reach CosmicNova.com in this example. So it's going to map it out for me. <clears throat> so think about it this way. Let's say you have a date or you are going somewhere that you've never been before. You open up your phone, you go to Google or Apple or whatever it is that you're using, you type in in your navigation the address that you want to visit. And it gives you all these routes that it takes. You know, it says go straight, go left, go right, this and that. The trace route kind of does the same thing in a sense. However, trace route, it will tell you whether there are certain roads or routes that you cannot take or that they're broken or non-existent. So that's a very simple explanation of what trace route does. It tells you whether a certain turn is broken or non-existent. Hence the name trace route. I hope that's an easy one to understand there. So we're going to see an example of this. As soon as I hit enter here, we're going to see what happens and I'm going to explain uh, all the steps that it's going through. All right, hitting enter. With trace out executed, this is typically what happens. It takes maximum of 30 hops, as in 30 roads or 30 paths, if you will, in order to reach the final destination, which is this IP address for this website. And this may take a while. This is why I have a finished trace route of all the routes taken for that website. And I will show you what that is right now. So let's have a look at some of the things that kind of stand out. The first thing, the first hop that shows up is basically pinging my IP address of the local computer. So the computer I'm using right now, local um, IP address for that is 192.168.1.1. So that's a typical local IP address. Second hop is basically trying to ping my IP address, external IP address for the internet. So my internet provider, which is Charter, is actually blocking that information for security reasons. It automatically blocks it. There's nothing I can do about it, but it's perfectly normal to see a second hop fail timeout like this. And then you can see that hops three through eight are all from my internet provider, charter.com. Is Charter is my internet provider. And you can see all these, if you will, switches that it takes in order to access the internet that goes the outside of the charters network. So it goes through all of these and it seems everything seems fine. So that's perfectly fine. And then finally it reaches the internet and then it has to go through this switch here. And again, it looks normal. This route is normal. And then it goes to the number 10. Again, it's normal. Then we look at 11 and we can see that there's increased millisecond response not necessarily too bad because we're not talking like 80 milliseconds, 100 plus or something like that. However, something does stand out here and that there is a third, on, on the third response or third attempt ping of it is there is no response whatsoever a timed out. So if we are having issues connecting to the final destination, potentially we could look at the switches or servers that are located at these two IP addresses. So the first one is 7214.23.232, um, I'm sorry, dot seven zero, and this other one that starts with 172. So because we see uh, no response here at all for the third uh, ping there, we can kind of possibly assume that there might be some kind of a latency issue with these two switches or nodes, if you will, or they could be server or whatever it is that they are we can look at that because it could be a server somewhere. And the reason I say server is in a sense, depending on which type of thing are we troubleshooting? Are we troubleshooting a website? Are we troubleshooting application connection, this and that? So it could be a you know, part of the final destination 
of like for example application that maybe uses some kind of database that is located at the server or whatnot or server itself could be the firewall we don't know but we need to know kind of why what's causing this you know delay or lack of response whatsoever if there is a problem right but typically that's associated with higher millisecond response time so in our case this is probably just normal and chances are that these servers here just have a limit of how many times you can ping it so we're going to move on from that and then it goes through a bunch of different nodes here which could mean that it's just blocking this is very typical that these nodes are literally just blocking these type of um, connection requests which is fine we can, but every time you see a gap in between where it fails somewhere this is something we would have to be concerned about and we'll potentially look at that here in a moment but this is an example of a good trace route response and then finally reaches uh, the uh, destination of 130.211.160.109 which is where cosmicnovo.com is located as you can see here so it took all the routes and it took it 23 routes to get to the final destination and we know that everything is okay here all right so i found a website that's supposed to be down a safe website and let's see do i have that going here yep i had it uh, tested it's anthem.com which is basically insurance provider health insurance provider and i saw that it's down let me just double check here one more time i'm going to ping it one more time to double sh to, to make sure that it's down and then we're going to do a trace route on it to see if we can figure out what uh, chances are it's the web server itself but it could be something in between too so i'm going to do a trace route on that as well and then I'm going to, and you can see that it failed. You know, sent for, received zero, it's timing out, definitely down. So we're going to do a trace route, RT, anthem.com, and see what kind of response we can get. Again, this may take a while, which I will just fast forward to the results so we can see what's going on with that. So as we are looking at the results of Anthem.com, you can see that they are similar to what we had earlier in the sense that it's taking same routes initially. And this kind of goes back to what I was talking about. See, this is the first one, and we can tell that it takes, you know, hits my LAN, and then it goes through all of these charter uh, switches, if you will. And if we go back here, we can see that they are the same switches and it takes that same route however after it hits those it decides to go another way which was indicated which was dictated by a this switch this switch says okay well now you know you're done with the charter network now you have to go through this something else so let's look at the previous one i'm sorry let's look. and did we take the same one five one six six so in our case, after the 166, Charter sent us to this other one, which ends with 12, which by the way, is probably next to it. So there is a switch probably next to it in the same data center. You can see how it's only off by three IP addresses. Anyways, it decided, in this case, for the Anthem.com, which is this top one, it decided to bypass the next switch, which typically would have been this one to route to cosmicnova.com um, well it, well it had to take another one here so instead of going to any of these other ones you can see that this one just said okay well this is going somewhere else and it takes a different route and it goes to this other probably internet provider of some sort which I'm assuming is related to AT&T and it doesn't say that here but the reason I know is if you look at these 7 through 10, we can see that the switches' names are STL, which is, stands for St. Louis, ORD probably stands for Orlando, Florida. And uh, we can see that they're called atlas.cogento.com. And you can see the IP address that are connected. Get number 10, 
we can see that it says ATT here, so which is AT&T, probably Orlando. So it goes through Florida somewhere, and then it continues with switches that are located or that are that belong to AT&T, and then routes it further. And you can see that it hits another three gateways, uh, most likely um, in uh, on on an AT&T server before it reaches its final destination. This is still taking forever, so once it's finished, I'll I'll show you uh, what the end result is for Anthem.com. However, I want to talk about a point of failure that may occur that may show up in trace route command. And here's a really good example. We can look at these AT&T switches here. So 11 through 13. Traceroute is, can tell you immediately whether something failed in, in the path that it's taking. So it's, we can imagine that in this example that number 12 here timed out. So let's pretend this one timed out, literally timed out and we need to figure out where is it at, who, wh what's wrong with this. Chances are if it timed out that either it's blocking the uh, this type of uh, information from being sent back, which happens with my IP address here. Uh, but however, if it's just kind of in the middle here and we know kind of just kind of by intuition that it's supposed to take another route because it goes to the third one here, but for some reason, just one, this one in the middle times out. That's a clear indicator of a switch that is, or the switch that is just bad. So, how do we find out, you know, if it's bad or not? Well, we would have to reach out to this guy or this company and ask them. Okay, well, we need to get somebody from AT and T on the call, or call them, or contact them, and say, "Hey, there's a problem here." And they'll be like, okay, well, let's send me the results of Traceroute from your location. And they send it, you send it to them, and then suddenly they're like, oh, the number 12 failed, but we still know it's kind of on their network because it keeps network. You see what I'm saying? It goes to AT&T. We know all three of these hops are going to be AT&T, but the middle one fails. That means it's still on their network. And the problem is on their network, and they need to look at this. And they would know. It would. I know it would say timed out here, but they would know what the next one would be or should be, or whether there is a break of some sort that prevents everybody, and that one switch is causing the problem. So they would look at this and they say, okay, well, we know it's on this network. Let's scour our network and look for this broken switch. And that's the point of Traceroute. Of course, there could be other examples of that, and that is, let's say this one doesn't time out, but there is a huge, huge latency issue here. That would also indicate, that would also be indicated by traceroute that there is a problem. So let's say the response time is like 100 milliseconds or even 80 milliseconds. This caused connection timeouts on the application and or a user end as well. So let's say there's a huge latency here. There's another reason why they would want to look at that switch or server and kind of see what's going on. The reason I say server is because it could be the final destination. We don't know. But in our case, we know it's not. It's just a switch that it's taking. And then with the trace route information, we can send forward this information to them and say, okay, well, you know, this is probably what's going on. I'm out and I'm going to kind of tell it to skip by hitting enter the attempt. For some reason it gets stuck like this, waiting to get a re uh, response from the switch. And then I'm going to fast forward this to the end result. So as the final result of the trace route is coming up, we can see that the uh, anthem.com is just simply down. This is what it tells us. The normal response from the trace route when everything's okay is indicated in my other window here and you can see that the final hop gives us the final destination address in our case of anthem.com it doesn't it never reaches it and this is clear indication that there's something wrong at the web server level 
So the webmaster for Anthem.com needs to look at it and resolve the issue at the server level. So, but you know, when we know that the website is down for everybody, this is not necessarily the reason we would use traceroute.com or traceroute to command for. We would simply just use ping command to see if it's up or down. But if there is an issue of latency, if there is an issue of website or an application working for some people but not others that are on a different network, we would use a trace route. So it's for troubleshooting connection issues that are specific to a network. You know, meaning that just because I can reach it doesn't mean that some other people can as well. So this is how you would use trace route to figure out where is the breaking point on their end and why can't they reach or why can't I reach a certain web server, application server, or what not. And in today's video, we're going to talk about Reliability Monitor. It's one of those tools that comes with Windows 10 that people don't really talk about or mention, but it's actually a really cool monitor that kind of uh, filters everything out for you when it comes to system issues or system events. So it's similar to Event Viewer, except it's a little bit easier to follow, a little bit easier to navigate through. And I'll show you exactly what I mean. So let's go ahead and pull up Reliability Monitor. You can simply search for it and just type in Reliability Monitor and what comes up is View Reliability History. Alternative way to get into it is through Control Panel. If you go to Control Panel, select Security Maintenance here and then expand maintenance and then from here we need to click on view reliability history we're going to click on that and now it expands our reliability monitor once more so what is again reliability monitor you can think of reliability monitor for example as a highly filtered version of event viewer so instead of giving you all the details for that one day on your computer, um, it gives you kind of filtered version of it that's much easier to follow and it kind of mostly points out um, software updates and critical issues that may happen on your computer. It lists successful and failed software and driver installations as well crashes, apps, and programs that stopped responding and other errors of course on a time-based scale. So what does that mean? That means it shows you events for every viewer, every day, I'm sorry, just like event viewer, except it's a lot more sp simplified and it gives you this kind of a graph with dates aligned as this. You can see the only main thing that keep in mind is that reliability monitor, monitor only goes back as far as one month. So it only gives you one month of uh, event viewing when it comes to issues on your computer, which could be good enough to kind of troubleshoot all the computer issues that are happening. Go back over a month ago to figure out what is going on right now with your computer. On top of that, uh, reliability monitor, it can often provide important clues about the cause of sudden changes in system behavior as well. And that can be determined by the events that happened. And it can also kind of gives you an idea why, for example, my computer is crashing. What happened with the application stop? You know, this and that. So again, it's an event viewer in a sense, except it's a lot more user-friendly, if you will. Or we can see that it gives you the details as well, but it also points out a critical event with this circle, with a, a red circle with the X in it. And then we have the uh, warning one and uh, exclamation mark here which is in yellow and then we just we have regular event here which is in blue so let's look at the first critical event and it says windows was not properly shut down and you can see how it's easily laid out for you and it gives you the date here and it says you know it's october 5th at 8 a.m and then of course on the right hand side of it you can click on view technical details which will give you more information on it if you select that so you can imagine you know your let's say your computer is unstable and says you know your computer is shutting down just randomly windows was not properly shut down so what does that mean it means that either somebody pulled the plug the power went out or something caused the crash so let's go ahead and click on view technical details and expands it and it gives you a little bit more information, but as far as the computer knows, it just it just knows that Windows was not properly shut down. So this could mean literally that it lost power. And then it also in description it says the previous system shutdown on 
uh, let's expect it. So it gives you an idea that, hey, this happened also five days ago. So that can give you a clue of what might be happening. So you can either ask the user, hey, do you remember it shutting down before? Or you can simply confirm what the user is saying, hey, this happened before. And then you look and look at it, you, you can say, hey, did this happen about five days ago? And then you can see that there's a pattern going on here. So very similar to Event Viewer. And of course, I have a video on Event Viewer. If you want to check that out, I'll toss a link on the right hand side here. So let's look at the uh, exclamation uh, one that it's just a warning and it says here Google update helper and it says unsuccessful application reconfiguration and it happened at on the same day at 8.08 um, a.m. So let's say somebody's complaining about Google Chrome for example because Google Chrome is the only product I have on this computer and of course it's going to have a Google update helper and then I can see well all right well something's going on here and then obviously it says here unsuccessful application reconfiguration so I'm going to click on view technical details and it's going to give me a little bit more of the information and again it kind of uh, repeats what it said earlier here and, and on the top and then in the description it says Windows installer uh, reconfigured the product and it gives you the product name and that is Google Update Helper and it gives you product version product language manufacturer Google LLC and then it gives you reconfiguration success or error status so at this point we don't know what happened because if it says unsuccessful uh, application reconfiguration as far as we know it could be just permission issues but at least we have an error status, which is the error code 1638. So we can simply Google this and find out on the internet what the, what this error actually means. But again, it could be just simple permissions issue, you know. And if user is complaining about Google not working properly, or Google Chrome or this and that, this kind of gives you a clue, at least a starting point. So let's just look at some of the uh, uh, blue. Uh, events that happened and informational events are down here and then again you can see there is uh, another Google update help, uh, helper and then it says here successful application reconfiguration and it happened kind of exact same time uh, where the where it unsuccessfully did it so that means most likely that it did get its uh, permissions that it needed to do so and then it actually did it so we can kind of confirm here that that well that was successful and we can see that the error status is zero so right away we can see well that's not the problem just because it failed here it actually succeeded below here so we're done with the google issue here and then of course we just have a regular event and it says here cumulative update for uh, .NET framework for Windows 10 and it says successful Windows update. So generally speaking, informational events are just that. It gives you information that something usually just happened normally and that is also good to know so that way we can kind of uh, exclude those things as possible problems for this PC. So with this tool, we can just keep going and scrolling through all the events. You can see some of them are just blank. There is basically just means there's no issues on those days. And then we got, again, just the, you know, the blue event that happened and it's just normal. But well, the ones we want to kind of concentrate on here are the ones that are critical events. For example, this setup host.exe stopped responding on October 13th at 8 53 a.m. and then we can just keep going and kind of look at those issues and what see what happened and it kind of gives you a really good starting point when it comes to figuring out what is wrong with all of these computer issues that may be happening and sure I can go through all this stuff together with you and let's just go ahead and take a quick look this one looks a little bit different because it's a setup host.exe and it says again stop responding at 8 53 a.m. and it gives you quite a bit more detail and this is going to vary from program to program of course but again, it gives you starting place to help you troubleshoot what the issue is. And for example, this one says stopped interacting with Windows and it was closed. To see uh, more information about the problem, um, check the problem history in the security maintenance control panel. So it gives you another starting point here. It also gives you application path in some cases and you can see where this program is located and this is a Windows component. And then let's look at the same thing similar and it says uh, for this uh, yellow exclamation mark right underneath it, it says notepad++ unsuccessful application 
installation and uh, we can see more details of this one as well again this one happened on 8 51 a.m and it says windows install install the product blah 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 and then installation success or error status so this is most likely a failed installation and then we can look up again what the error is to clarify that information well there you have it guys this is a very useful tool in my opinion if you don't want to look all the information um, in the event viewer if you find that confusing because i can see how event viewer could be uh, harder to navigate through especially for new people to tech support so Hey, if you get an issue from a user or a report, a user reports an issue, it says, hey, my computer's unstable. I don't know what's going on. Reliability monitor, monitor is a good place to start to give you a quick look to see what's going on with that PC. All right, I hope you like this video. Please share it with friends. If you have any questions, please let me know. Leave any likes and I will see you next time. Thank you for watching. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Welcome to CosmicNovo.com, a science and technology website. We have many articles related to these topics, but also offer a helping hand in IT job assistance. That being said, a collaborating YouTube channel under the name of Kobuman has a large amount of support video material to further assist you. Thank you for stopping by and we wish you best of luck. Hi there, are you looking to get an IT job? Well, I can help you with that. My website, CosmicNova.com, can prepare you for the most important part of getting that IT job. Sure, you can apply for the job, you can get your resume straight, you can get that interview, but can you pass that interview? That's the most important part of it. Sometimes it comes down to just personality, but what else can you do with that? Well, I can prepare you exactly for those specific IT jobs. For example, I have videos and articles on that. My website, CosmicNova.com, links to everything that you need to get that IT job. Are you applying for a help desk? Are you applying for system administration, desktop support, network operations, network administration, or other ones? It doesn't matter. I can prepare you for all of those. Check out my website, CosmicNova.com, or just follow the link below. I will help you with not only written material, but I also have videos on it specifically made and voiced by yours truly. It's all professional, guys. Come check it out, and it's free. What do you got to lose? Just click on the link and stop by. I wish you best of luck. Hello, my friends. My name is Irvin, also known as Koboman. Today's video, I wanted to talk about processes and services found within Windows 10. It will be similar with Windows 7 if you're still working with Windows 7 operating system. But mainly this is for desktop support. For example, you get a trouble ticket and the issue is kind of unknown, but you know that the user is, you know, reporting issues with performance or there's a certain application that doesn't run properly or refuses to run. So one of the things we would have to look at is processes or services, you know. I mean, there are many situations in which this could be useful. It just depends on the situation, you know, on the issue at hand. And we just have to spend a little bit more time and trying to figure out what it is that might be causing an issue, right? So obviously the first we uh, the best way to get to the processes and services is through our task manager, right? So I have it open here, but obviously, guys, I'm sure you know this already. If you right-click on your taskbar, you can just select uh, task manager. Also, if you do control alt delete um, you will get to a window where you can simply start the task manager. So let's start from the top. And here you can see right off the bat that there are some programs that are taking up a lot of CPU power, right? If yours is not sorted like this, you can simply select this column, so click on it, and it will sort it out whether you want it to display the highest used first or last. By the way, if you recently or have never opened up a task manager on your computer, it will look just like this. It will not have any details. It will just have the last application that you have open running like so. You know, in order to bring it back to what used to be default in Windows 7, you would simply select more details here, and it would expand it, expand it back to what I consider as normal. 
Okay, so here we are again, and now we know that there are a couple of applications now using up most of our CPU. So let's say your trouble ticket says, my computer is running slow, you know, and then you can look at this here, and you can see that, in my case, OBS64 is taking up most processing power. So what is this OBS64? See, this is the next thing we need to figure out. If we are suspecting that this is the software causing the issue for the user, we have to kind of figure out what it is. It, it, unless you're familiar with this, you, it could be anything. It's, you just know that it's taking up a lot of processing power and quite a bit of RAM, right? So if I right click on it, right? First of all, I did went ahead and expanded it, right? There's a little arrow here. If you click on it, you will expand it. And you can see other sub sub services or sub processes that are running underneath it, right? This is one thing that Windows 10 is doing. It's kind of grouping the same uh, process or the processes for the same application within um, under under the same tab, if you will. So now that it expanded, we can see individual things that are running. So what is this? Why? What is this? It's causing issue. You know, I could just right click it, you know, and, and task, and that would kill it. However, it would also, there's a chance that it also might come back if it's a part of, part of the processes that belong to a certain program that the user is using. We don't know that yet, so we have to figure out what it is, right? The first thing we have to look at is what is this process? Where is it coming from? Why is it, you know, taking up so much power, uh, so much CPU power on this computer? Well, we can find that out, right? So what we got to do is right click on the actual process and it's not this top part of it, right? This is just a tab. This all tells us is there are three different instances of, of processes related to the same application. The actual process for this application that's taken up this much power is this one, right? It's OBS 64, the actual process, right? So if we right click it and select properties, we can see some details about it, right? We can see that, uh, you know, its location, what kind of uh, executable is. We can tell that it's installed in C program files x86, and we can tell it's OBS Studio. So right there, it kind of, you know, tells us, well, what is this studio? When, when you think about studio, you can think a couple of different things right off the bat. Video recording, audio recording, something like that, right? So that's a hint right there. And we can tell that it's located within bin folder, and it's also uh, under 64-bit folder, right? So this is a typical, normal application uh, format for the folders that you would see in within root of C, right? So if we click on details here, we can see a little bit more information about it. We can see the last date it was modified, which was in March 1st, 11.04 a.m. So we know this uh, application executed last time there, right? At that time, I should say. So that's all great, right? This looks okay. We don't see anything, you know, super, super sketchy, right? However, we can also find out more, right? If we right-click again on our process and go to open a file location, it will open up that folder location that we looked at within the properties of that process. And here we are, Program Files x86, OBS Studio bin 64-bit. And now, here's our process, it automatically highlights it for us, right, which is actually really cool, right? We know that this is the process that it's running in the background and it's causing, um, you know, it's, it's using up a lot of CPU. So now we know that it's there, and, you know, by looking at different things here, we can also kind of uh, get a hint that this will deals with AV, which is audio video, and we, we can tell we can tell it says it's Kodak, and then there is an AV filter, and then there's AV format. So what does that tell us? Just by looking at those hints, we can probably assume that this is audio or video software right as if as as just like we hinted earlier right and the reason i'm explaining it to you in such a way so that you guys can think uh for yourself whenever you're troubleshooting these type of issues so you can figure out is this application okay or not right but in fact if i were to you know um you know uh, google obs 64 it would tell me that obs is simply screen recording software which indeed is 
running for us right here, right? So that's how you can find out what type of process is causing the slowdown for the user's computer, right? And you can also at the same time figure out, you know, what kind of software it is, be even before you go to Google and search what it is, right? Of course, if you worked for the company for a while, you'll you'll probably have a good idea of what kind of software should be running in the background, and something like this wouldn't necessarily be there, right? We certainly wouldn't want to have a recording. Well, you know, we know that users are recorded, in, you know, within businesses, but this type of software wouldn't be recording it, right? So this is certainly a no-no. So let's look at a couple other things that that are present here, right? So let's let's look at. Uh, I'm just I'm just gonna pick a random because they keep fluctuating right here, but I'm gonna pick a random one that just comes up. So here we go. Uh, okay, client server runtime process. Let's look at that one, right? I'm gonna see what that is. We know that it's a Windows process right off the bat because it's located within the C Windows system 32 right this is where most of our you know DLLs are located anything that uh, would be registered uh, through registry right this is just a regular process that runs in the background um, th hence it's located within C Windows system 32 client server runtime process um, in our case again we can go to our let's see if I can catch it real quick there it is I think I caught it. No, system runtime, <laughs> client server runtime process. There we go. I'm going to open file location, and here is our C Windows, um, C colon Windows system 32 folder. This is our systems folder, and sure enough, it's right here. And it, again, it's highlighted, and we can say, and we can see that it's been installed um, in um, 9/29/2017. So it's been on this computer for a while which is actually a really good indicator um, unless you know unless you know it would be it would be kind of crazy to have a virus installed for this long on, on the computer and nobody notice you know what i mean so most of the time um, having something this old running in the background as part of windows um, you know processes in the background it's perfectly fine again if you're unsure what this is and you know let's go ahead and do this right client server runtime process Let's go ahead and look that up in Google, right? And it'll give us a little bit more detail of what it is. Client server runtime process, right? You Google it and it's uh, it tells you right there what it is. It's a client subsystem, is a component of Windows NT family of operating systems that provides the user mode side of Windows 32 subsystem and is included within those. So this process uh, this application has been around since Windows 3, Windows NT 3.1. Perfectly safe. So now you guys have a really good idea on how to troubleshoot these weird uh, processes that might be running in the background. Now, as I promised, we're going to look at the services, right? Let's go ahead and look at the services. Now, services are important in a way where you have to kind of consider... Um, what it is that my computer needs when it comes to operating smoothly? And what I mean by that is that certain components of Windows um, or a Windows operating system and certain applications requires these services, uh, requires certain services to work um, at certain times. Some applications require them to run at the boot up at the boot up of the computer, at the login of the user, and such and such. Otherwise, the application wouldn't work. One example for that is printing, right? If you don't have a printing service enabled after you reboot the computer, the printer service starts, and that allows you to print, right? As simple as that. And that particular one should be here somewhere there it is. Print, it's called print spooler, right? This is the service that runs in the background that allows you to print. As simple as that. And of course, you can get to the services if you just go in here and just type in services, right? It gives you it gets you to the same thing. Alright. You can find 
print services, right? Here we go. Print spooler here, and we can tell also that it's running and it's automatic. So how do we know it actually starts automatically? Well, if we if we have it here, if we just double click it, we can tell that it's automatic and it happens as soon as your computer restarts, right? And of course, if you stop it, if I click stop here, now I can't print anything. At the same time, some businesses, in order to save paper, you know, environmentally friendly or save ink or whatever the reason may be, you can actually disable this. So if I disable and click apply, now nobody can print on this computer ever afterwards unless you have administrator privileges to change this back, right? So I'm just going to change it back to automatic, which means that it will start up whenever it's needed and on the reboot, right? It's going to restart itself. So, right, but you know, after you enable it, you have to obviously click start again to, um, to get it going again. So that's the point of services. Some applications require services to run in the background in order for them to function properly, and some of them are simply part of Windows operating system. All right, guys, thank you so much for watching. I hope you like this video. If you have any more questions, please leave them below. I also have a forum website at kobuman.com if you'd like to check that out. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Share with your friends. Thank you so much. Again, have a good day. Bye-bye. Hello my friends, my name is Irvin, also known as Kobuma, and in today's video I will show you how to create an archive folder within Outlook. As a desktop support personnel or help desk, you will be doing this a lot. You will get troubleshooting tickets that simply ask, can you create an archive for me, or can you help me locate an archive file for me? Be sure to stick around because I will show you the difference between a PST and OST file because they're quite different and the reason why you should know this and its location within user's local profile. So let's get to it. There are a couple of different ways to go about creating an archive file. There's a longer way and there's a shorter way. I will first show you the longer way, which is if you look to your left-hand side on the upper left corner, there's a, a button called File, which is right up here. It's usually yellow like this. Go ahead and select that. This will basically take you to your account settings. Within here, or when you just need to select account settings, and then account settings once more. And here, when we have this pop up, it will be a second tab over here where it says data file. Once we select that, here we can add an archive file. If you want to add an archive file, you would simply select. add. And here you will basically choose a location for your Outlook archive file. In our case, this is the default location for, we're just going to leave it at that. So we're just going to rename it to our new archive. So that way we can find it and I can show you exactly where it's at. And just go ahead and select OK. Now if you noticed on our left hand side, right here, a new thing has appeared and this is our archive folder. So let's go ahead and close this so we can see what we have here. This is our new archive, and if you expand that there's really nothing there besides delete items folder and search folders file. If you want to recommend to users, you can simply say, if you want to create new folders within, you can simply do so by right-clicking it and then create a new folder. They can name it whatever they want. Let's say they can call it inbox, right? They can call it inbox, and now they have an inbox folder. And if they want to drag, and drop things from their inbox. Right now mine is empty, but if there were emails right here, they would select on their main inbox and they would dra drag and drop their files that they want to store inside of this archive folder. You can also set up a rule that basically moves all of your old emails into this new inbox. And you can set this up based off of how old it is. Let's say if emails are older than you know six months, have them automatically moved to here. And again, you can create new files, or I should say new folders. Let's say this is just a, a name, let's say uh, uh, old emails, right? Let's just call it old emails. Now we have a folder called old emails. And if that's what you want to do, that's fine too. But in a nutshell, this is how you do it real quick. Another way to do it is just from within here, and this is a little bit faster. If you select this second icon here where it says new items, 
If you select that and go all the way down, see where it says more items, let that expand and then move to the right and you're going to have an option to select Outlook data file. This essentially does the same thing. And this one, we're just going to call it second archive. And a lot of people that need help with this will also have, chances are, will have multiple archives. And then once we select that, then we're going to have our second archive folder here that we can do the exact same stuff that we did with this previous one, right? Now, let me show you the difference between that and an OST file and where these are located. So let's say somebody, you know, contacts you, let's say your help desk or desktop support, and they say, hey, I can't find my archive file. Well, I'll show you the default location where they are located. I'm just going to minimize this real quick, and then we're going to go to our root of C, right? And then we're going to go to user's local profile, and this is located in root of C. And then we're going to select users. And here, in our case, we're logged in as the administrator. So whatever their login uh, login ID is, that's probably what's going to be the name of their local profile in here. So let's say I logged in with Koboman1. This is where the archives would be that I've just created. However, I'm logged in as administrator, so I'm just going to go inside of that. So just to kind of go back real quick, we are in a root of C, right? Root of C, folder called users. And then we selected the name for the login of this user. In my case, it's the administrator. The Outlook archives are by default located in our Documents folder. So if we double click Documents, we will see our Outlook Files folder. Once we open that, we can see all the archives that we created, right? So let me just go back here again because I really like to show this as slow as possible. So it's root of C, Users, Login ID for the user that's logged in, Documents, and then Outlook files, right? Now, this is not to be confused. Uh, okay, let me show you real quick here what the file extension of this is. You can see that it's a .pst. This is why it's called a PST. This is why it's also called a PST, I should say. So Outlook data file, also known as PST. Now, this is different from an OST, which, be, which will be located in our app data. So let's go back to our um, local profile. So we're inside of our local profile. Now we need to go inside of an app data folder. In our case, it's by default, app data is set to be invisible, but we know it's there. There's a folder within here called app data, right? It's hidden by default. Um, so in order to go to it, we can just simply dive in backslash app data, and it's there. Now we're inside of our app data. Just to kind of go over it again, root of C, users, name, login name for the person that's logged in, in my case, it's an administrator, and then app data, right? Now we're going to look for our OST file. And the next place, a couple of more folders that we need to navigate, the next one is local, and then Microsoft, right? See? App data, local, Microsoft. And then one more, which is also called Outlook. Now, once we go inside of this, then there won't be a file name in their OST at all because I am not connected to the Exchange server right now. As you can see here, there is no, I'm actually not connected. But once you go in here, there will be a file with similar icons as the, uh, the archive folder, but it will be called OST. The difference between that and the archive file is that the OST is essentially offline version of your inbox. So let's say you connect to the Exchange server, the first time you connect, it's going to start populating this. All of this is going to start to get populated because you'll have emails, this and that. Well, that has to go somewhere, right? Well, it's stored inside of the OST file, which is typically located here, right? I'm just going to create a file here just so it's better, easier to visualize. And we're going to call it, um, you know, offline email, right? Because I really want you guys to understand this. And the extension will be OST, right? It'll be something, the way it's going to look like is actually going to be similar to, uh, basically, a lot of times it's the uh, name of the user. So in our case, it's the administrator. So it'll be their login ID and then, you know, some, you know, numbers or, or letters, you know, depending how it's set up. But it's going to be offline email for that user, Right. So that's how you would basically reset it. So let's say there are any issues with the inbox, their local inbox, not the archive. You would basically go in here, right? And then you would delete their OST file. You delete it, 
So when the user goes back in here, it's going to be blank. They're, all their stuff will be gone, but it will be it will repopulate. On underneath here, you would see that you know when it connects to the Exchange server, it's going to say updating the folders, and it's going to eventually update this all of this. Well, since I already have you guys here, let me show you something real quick, and that is how to reset email. So let's say a person's profile is corrupted, their email is corrupted, and there are issues that, uh, you know, they're causing email. You know, they can't receive, they can't send, this and that. One way to reset their email profile is if you go to Control Panel. I'm sure you guys know how to, you know, go to Control Panel. If you're in Windows 10, just type in Control Panel. And if you're in Windows uh, 7 or something older, you can just go to Start and Control Panel, all right? Once you have control panel open, look for an icon called mail. This controls basically everything that is about your mail, except you don't have Outlook open. If you have Outlook open, you won't be able to make any changes. So make sure that Outlook is closed before you mess with these settings. Go ahead and open up your mail, uh, double click your mail icon. And here you can view your email account. So if you select email account, let me slow down here, guys. I don't want to go too fast. So if you select email account, you will get this pop up and it looks similar to what we did earlier, right? It's, it's identical. It's essentially the same thing. If you go to data files here, we can see our archive files. Here you can remove them, add them, this and that. And of course, if, if you want to add somebody's uh, archive folder, you can certainly do that. Let's say it's not added here and it's not visible in their Outlook. This is how you do it. You just click add and then you look for it, right? You will look for it find it and click OK, and then, then it's going to appear on their left-hand side. Then that way they can see their Outlook um, archive again, right? Here we can delete, also delete, and remove email accounts. If you select new, we can connect to the exchange or, you know, do whatever we want. And that's how we would add a new email account. Uh, this user can, you know, log into it, this and that. But how do we fully reset it, right? Let's go ahead and close this. And the way we do do that is by removing the profile for the user. And that would be the third tab down here, right? If we click on that, the second tab here is just same place we were here a minute ago, right? A second ago, I should say, for data files, right? So it's essentially the same thing we can get to from here. But anyways, what I'm talking about is profile, email profile, right? We can reset this and create a brand new profile that everything is brand new to it. I mean, there's a way to reset this if you go manually and look for the folders uh, that, that are related to this in-app data, this and that. But this is an easier way for you guys to uh, actually do it. And it will just do it for you. So if you select Show Profiles, you can see that I have one profile. This is mine profile. Let's say this one is corrupt. Well, we can actually create a new one. So if we just click Add and we name it New Profile, right? Let's call it New Profile. Click OK. Now we can collect, uh, select New Profile, right? We can, you know, once it connects, you put in all the information, it's going to create a new one here, right? So I went ahead and created a new profile, right? Now we have a new profile. So how do we actually use that new profile, right? Well, if we go back in and just click OK, whenever the user launches Outlook again, it's going to go to their old one, right? And why is that? Well, because we haven't selected a new profile. So if we open it back up, go to Show Profiles, we can see that there are two of them, right? But what we need to actually change is always use this profile down here, right? And then we need to select it and check new profile, right? And then click apply, click OK. And now when the user launches Outlook again, it's going to create a brand new profile. It's going to reset everything for them and hopefully resolve all the issues, right? All right, guys, thank you so much for watching. I try to make this one as, as clear to understand as possible. Just a reminder, I have a Patreon page. If you'd like to support me, uh, there's a link in the description box below. Also, I will be posting this video on Twitch. I'm thinking about actually using uh, using using Twitch for some live sessions, uh, I guess free tech support or whatnot. So if you're interested in that type of stuff, please let me know in below and then I might set up a, uh, a scheduled type of, I guess, meeting, if we will, where you guys can ask me questions. We can resolve some text tech related or IT related desktop support issues together. Thank you so much for watching guys. I appreciate you very much. Have a good one. Bye bye. Hello my friends, my name is Irvin, also known as Koboman. In today's video, we're going to talk about Windows updates. Windows updates is one of those things that happens in the background. People don't really think about it too much. But when it comes to desktop support, it's incredibly important to know what they are, especially if you're the guy that pushes all the Windows updates to all the computers in a business environment. What we're going to do in this video, we're going to talk about Windows updates, what they mean, how you can find 
what they're about before you actually push them to all the computers in your business. We want to make sure that we don't break all the computers before we do anything like that. So it's kind of, it's incredibly important to know this type of stuff. This is going to be one of those uh, fun videos, not just for desktop support, but also for help desk. If you like to learn about IT, stick around as we are going to go through this and we're going to explain all things that we need to know about Windows updates and all the things that we can pretty much find out when it comes to Windows updates. All right, guys, if you get one second, please click the like button. It really means a lot to me. That way, I know you guys like my stuff, and I'll keep making more videos because of that. Thank you so much, and let's get into it. All right, guys, let's get into the meat and potatoes of this video. Windows updates. What do we need to know about Windows updates? Let's have a look on Windows updates, how they look like on your computer. I'm sure you already know this, but this is how you get to them. If you click on the Start button and then click Settings, and then if you click update and security and that's just one way of getting to windows updates so this is what you see nowadays this is, has changed a lot from windows 7 and it kind of looks like this now where it gives you a little bit more options right now i have paused windows updates and for the right reasons because i wanted to show you uh, how it looks like when it starts updating in case you're not aware most of you, I'm sure, have seen this happen on your computer, but a lot of times it just happens in the background and it just kind of does its thing. So here's an example of security intelligence update here for Microsoft Defender Antivirus. So what that was actually was an update for your built-in Windows antivirus software and we could we saw that what they called a KB, which is a knowledge base article about that. Here's another one here, and this one is a update for Windows 10 version 19.09 for X64 based system. And here's the KB number for it. So, so KB, we're going to copy this KB, the whole thing. So it's KB4497165. And then we're going to look it up on the internet to see exactly what this is. But we can tell kind of here what it might be kind of in just general so it's kind of vague right now all it tells us it's update from windows 10 version 1909 and down here you can see that it's a fairly large uh, or an important update that it requires a restart so there's a pop-up here that says restart and of course we have a you know big old restart button here so let's kind of dig into this version 1909 why does it say version 1909 well let's see what our windows version is so if you go to search button and just type in w-i-n-v-r v-e-r i'm sorry so if you hit enter it gives you the windows version so here it is it's our version 1909 microsoft version 1909 and again it's pretty vague and it just tells us that it is update for that specific os build so it's uh, Windows uh, version 1909. All right, so if you do me a favor and pause the video here and kind of check which version you have on your computer, and I'm really curious to which version you guys are using, you'd be surprised. I bet some of you have a version like 1809 or even something else. Let me know in the comments. I'm really curious about that. All right, so we have copied our KB. Now we're going to open up, let me see here, you know what, let's just open Edge. See if it works. I've actually seen Edge work sometimes, and sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it just crashes out of the blue, but that's okay. We're going to just open it up, and we're going to go to Googleage and search for our knowledge article, is what I call them. Um, don't know exactly what they would call it. Hey, there is no connectivity, which is really, really surprising because I know I do have connectivity. Huh, cannot connect securely to this page. Oh, there it is. That was really bizarre, guys. I'm not sure. It could be my internet that is causing this issue. Although I did get a new modem just literally last week. Maybe it's my router. Maybe I need to change some uh, router setting. So here, here's our... Uh, KB here, and it's 4497165. Let's see if it refers to that. 4497165. We have double checked that. And here is a knowledge article from Microsoft. Here it is. 
It's an Intel microcode update, and now we can kind of dig into this and kind of see what this is about. Again, this is good to know for somebody who is working desktop support before you push these type of updates to all the computers in the environment or a business environment. So let's look at what kind of it's in what this is about from top to bottom. So you can see that it's an article and that there is the title of it, and it says here applies to Windows Server. Applies to Windows Server version 1903, all editions Windows 10 uh, version 1903, all editions Windows Server and Windows version 1909, and then all editions, and then there is more. So basically, it's an update for all versions of Windows that are 1903 through 1909. Okay, and in the summary, it says. It, you know, basically, it's a description of it, and it's an upgrade. It's an update to Intel Microcode for the following products of, of CPUs. Basically, is what they're talking about. So here are different types of CPUs. These are all different types of Intel CPUs, and that's what the updates is for. So it's we got Demerton, Sandy Bridge, Sandy Bridge E, Valley View, Whiskey Lake U. And then there's these other ones. We got Haswells, Haswell desktops, a lot of server type of stuff. So in the nutshell, this article tells us a lot more information than what we see here in just a basic kind of title of Windows updates. And as desktop support, you want to look and read this whole thing the whole thing before you actually decide to push this update. And of course, you want to test it in a business type of in, in environment. Uh, basically, you want to test it on a computer that you have, like in the lab that you're testing before you, you know, push these. It's probably okay. You know, these are all just, you know, just a microcode update for, you know, CPUs. And They've, obviously, they've been tested by Microsoft before they decided to update. But this is the same type of thing you have to do as somebody who does desktop support as well. So that's a, a one important thing. This example just happened to be this microcode update, and it's a good example because you don't want to like you know you don't want to break all your system by installing a new microcode on your computer. But let's kind of look at an update history so we can look at another example of a Windows update. All right, so I'm going to close this. We're going to restart a little bit later, but I first want to show you this other. Hey guys, I'm sorry to interrupt the video here, but I just want to pause it real quick and just kind of clarify that where I'm going right now is a place where Windows updates can be removed. The reason I'm going to this tab or this area is because it's easier to kind of talk about installed updates that are already on there. However, if you want to see the full history of updates on this computer, you can just kind of pay attention to this arrow that is pointing to that. So we wouldn't necessarily go anywhere else from this tab if you just want to see the updates that are on there. You know, some updates are not removable, but the page I'm going to are the ones that you can remove them. Uh, type of Windows update. So to see those, we actually have to go to Apps and Features. So I'm going to right click our little Start button here. We're going to click Apps and Features. And it's not going to be here. We're going to have to go to our other old school type of uh, ad remove software or program that you have probably are familiar from Windows 7 and older operating system. So right here, we're going to actually click on Programs and Features. This is going to take us to a place that gives us a lot more details of what it's installed. And I personally like it better because it's kind of a smaller font. It's more compact and you can see a lot more. So this is a typical place where you would see all the things that are installed on your computer, whether it's just some programs, some distributable packages, you know, everything that you've pretty much installed manually and things that have installed automatically. But that's not exactly what we are looking for here. We were looking for actual updates. And that is actually located right here, right above Turn on Windows Features on and off. There's a button called View Installed Updates. So we're going to select that and check it out. Now I'm going to kind of move this around a little bit here so I can show you something very interesting. I'm going to squeeze this here. Oh, okay, that's good enough. So I wanted to show you, remember the uh, KB that we looked at first? It was KB4497165. 
Well, here it is. It's actually here on the bottom. And on the right side here, if you notice, there is no installed on date. So there is the installed on column. And there's no install on date because we still haven't rebooted here. We're still waiting for it to actually fully install. And once that's done, we're going to have the actual installed on date here. And the reason I'm telling you this is because this is what this is the uh, order uh, that it's um, sorted out by default. So once you open this, the bottom one is always going to be the most current, most current uh, Windows update. So we're going to start looking from the top, and that's the first thing that in, was installed. And it was uh, on June 18, 2018, and the first thing that got installed was KB2565063, which is just basically a Microsoft Visual C++ 2010 redistributable. So what that is, it's just a package that you that is required to run a certain program. Some programs require this, and this is what that is. It's kind of self-explanatory. We can look it up just to confirm. So it's 2565063. Let's go back to our Google. I'm going to type in 2565063. Is that what it was? That's right. 2565063. 2565063, and here it is, the first update for Microsoft Windows. And it's very vague. We don't know what this is. So this is our good opportunity to figure out what that is. So it's KB4556799. All right, let's see. 455. see, my short-term memory. It's really early in the morning, so I can't. Exactly, sometimes 6799, 6799. I had my coffee, but my short memory is not that great. So let's see here. Again, March March 12th, that's when it was created. And if it's 4556799, we're going to click on that. I'm going to move it up here and see what that is. All right, so here's a, here it is. It's kind of the same thing. We can see here what it applies to again. And uh, you can certainly read that as well. And you can see the actual release date on it. My computer got it, let's see here, eight days later. Did I say March? I'm sorry. It was actually May that it installed on. <laughs> um, now, this one is actually also vague, which is kind of very disappointing. I wish we could get more information on this. But if we scroll down and we can see that there are highlights for this knowledge base article and all it is it, it just tells us that it's updates to improve security when using Internet Explorer and Microsoft Edge, updates to improve security when using input devices and updates to verify user password. So these are just regular updates to the basically kind of security settings that are kind of used in Windows operating system. And you can see how it goes on, improve security when using Microsoft Xbox, Windows, uh, improve security and Windows perform basic operations. So these are just regular things that they keep updating to kind of make sure that everything stays secure on your computer. And that's what this update is about. It's very vague. It's not a like critical update or anything like that. It's just something that they keep doing and doing to kind of improve things on the operating system. So here's a security update that I wanted to show you, and it's KB4552152. Uh, Let me see if I can remember that. 21552. Nope. I need more coffee, guys. 45521. 2152. Okay, there it is. All right, so we're going to click on this one. There it is, 4552152. And again, we can go through this and verify what it is. And this update makes a call the impermanence to service stack, which is the components that installs Windows updates. So this is an update to Windows update. <laughs> okay, all right, sure. And it's labeled a security update. All right. I mean, I'm not sure about these labelings that they're using at this point. But the point is of this whole video is that you want to look up as much information and find out as much information about any Windows updates before you push them to mass computers and definitely want to test them out. 
<laughs> there's not much we can do when it comes to kind of being really deep into this and looking at the code and this and that. And when it comes down to it, it's up to it's up to uh, Microsoft to share this information. And it again, this is kind of disappointing, but it is very very vague, very vague. Um, when you do desktop support, you will have control of which updates are installed at which times and you know this and that which is a great thing otherwise I'm not sure how how else you could deal with this and when it comes to these type of updates Microsoft is 100% in control and, and when it comes to what they are actually working on and what they're fixing and you as somebody who does desktop support would just have to make sure that they're safe and you would have to do some testing before you actually deploy them and that can take sometimes up to a month or even more the update is but you definitely want to figure out as much as possible what it's about and do extensive testing when it comes to some of this stuff and yes I know most of these things you can just literally you know just install and test it if it's a minor update or it's just update you know this and that you still don't want to like install it and say hey it works fine on this computer now you want to kind of hang in there for at least a week I want to say with some computers being used actively used to see if everything is okay just to make sure that that is cool alright guys I want to wrap this video up especially because I hear uh, construction work right now I don't know if you guys can hear that there's a jackhammer outside right now uh, they're working on the road here in front of my house so I'm gonna wrap this up and I hope you like this type of content I will definitely have more and I'll have more packages, kind of more crash courses. I see that more more, and a lot of people like this type of stuff. And I thank you so much for watching. Tell your friends about me if they like IT stuff and I'll talk to you next time. Take care now. Bye-bye. Welcome to my video, my friends. Uh, my name is Irvin, also known as Kobo Man. And today I wanted to talk about remote desktop and some of the troubleshooting methods you can use in order to resolve those type of issues. This idea came from my article that is called Top 10 Hard Desktop Support Interview Questions and Answers that you can find in the link in the description below if you want to read it. So in my previous video, I just wanted to mention I randomly picked a situation in uh, which uh, we created a really good video about and it was related to missing files and desktop icons. If you'd like to check that out, there also will be a link available at the end of this video and in the description uh, below. So let's look at this first question that uh, we are going to uh, talk about today. And uh, it's related to when using a remote desktop, you come to realize that the remote computer is not, not reachable by using a host name. So let's see what happens, what you normally try to connect to a remote desktop. I'm going to open up a remote desktop here, and I'm going to connect to my computer that's called Tech Support. This is a host name for this computer. Now, not to be confused with the IP address. You can also connect using an IP address to a remote computer. So instead of just typing in Tech Support, which you would normally do, when it comes to a business environment, you can also type in, and let's see, ping tech support. You can also use its IP address. And in our case, this is a version 6 IP address, which we would use to connect to it at computer. So in a type of, uh, in a business type of environment, chances are you would see a normal, you know, standard type of IP address that's just, you know, regular version 4, and uh, and that's perfectly fine. So instead of using the host name, you would type in that IP address in here, and it would connect the same way. But normally, all you would do is just type in the host name, uh, click connect, and then you can type in your login ID, which I already have. It's called YT login. And then you would type in your password, and it would connect just like this. Just a moment, let me switch my picture here real quick. There it is. Okay. 
I almost needed to troubleshoot that first. So this is what happens when you connect to a remote computer. Now, you know, you can pretty much do everything that you would normally do. And that's the whole point of remote desktop. Video. So this is normal. But let's see what happens when I know that a computer is turned on and we try to connect to it. So my other computer is just called Kobuman. And on it, I have um, a remote desktop is disabled. So when I try to connect to it now from this computer, it's going to fail. And uh, we'll see what the errors are. You see, it says remote desktop can't connect to the remote computer for one of the reasons. Remote access to the server is not enabled. So what is that? What is that? Well, let's have a look. If I go to properties of this computer, so you go to properties of this computer, we can see, okay, I just want to make sure I have this. Okay, there it is. It says remote access to the server uh, to the server is not enabled. That means that when we go to advanced system settings here, okay, And it's asking me for admin privileges so I can access this. If you go to the advanced system properties and go to the far uh, right tab, which is called remote, this may be disabled like so. That might be the cause, and that's what that is talking about. I don't know if you saw that. It actually flashed at first. Like, I thought it was going to disconnect it, although I didn't click apply or okay or anything like that. So... Um, and the next thing that it says here, uh, the remote computer is not, is the remote computer is turned off, which is not, or a third, the remote computer is not available on the network, right? So those are the key factors for a successful remote desktop session. However, if we go back to our question, it says here, keep, keep in mind the remote computer is turned on and it's awake and it's on the same network. You see, it says, keep in mind that the remote computer is turned on, awake, and on the same physical network. So that's not the problem. So what I would, what would I do? What would I do? The way I would answer this question or troubleshoot this is, um, well, first of all, if this is an interview type of situation, I would, you know, present them, you know, few ways of going about it and what it may be. This is just to give the potential employer or a future employer um, an idea of how I troubleshoot things and also that I am indeed knowledgeable and know what I'm talking about. So I would have first, second, third, and last example of what it could be, right? So my first idea would be, well, I would check to see if the remote computer's host name is part of the same domain. And uh, the way you could check that is by going to the Active Directory you see, you, you you just see if the you know if that host name is there. For example, we used here you know Kobuman as the name of the host. So I would go inside of Active Directory and say, hey, is Kobuman as in the name of the computer host name? Is it in there or not? And then go from there. And then also I would check to see if the remote computer is enabled within the domain, even if it has been added. So of course it could be part of the domain, but it could also be disabled. So once once it's part of a domain or Active Directory, if you will, you can have a host name in there, but if it's disabled, then it's not usable, right? So second, second thing, I would try to ping the computer by using the host name. If an error comes up, uh, if, if an error comes up, it would determine my next step. So we did a ping here for the tech support, and uh, let's go ahead and do the same thing for the other one since we started doing that one. Let's ping Kobuman here. CMD ping Kobuman. See, there's another proof here that the computer is turned on. We just can't reach it. And uh, the, it, this is a normal ping. It's a zero loss. Zero loss, that means the computer is turned on and everything's fine. There's a perfect, there's connection there. We just cannot connect to it as we've demonstrated earlier. So what could be the problem? Let's go back to our answer for the second. For example, if the message is, it says cannot resolve host name, I would try pinging the computer using its 
IP address. So that kind of goes back to me connecting to a computer just by using an IP address. So, and that, my third part of that actually ties into that on what the reason for that is. If there is an issue with DNS, meaning that uh, the main name service, the main name service, I think I got there, DNS, the main name service, the main name system, I think that's what it actually stands for. Uh, basically, what that does is resolves, um, it basically takes the host name, in our case, Kobuman, and tells uh, the, the server or other computers on the network what the IP address for that is. So, Kobuman, as the name of the computer, is basically just uh, an alias, right? And the DNS basically takes that and it translates it and it forwards it to the correct IP address automatically. So if I can't connect to the Kobo man by using a host name, but I can connect using the IP address like this, like this, if I can <laughs> if I can highlight it. Alright, control C, 